We are watching the full debate between Anna Kasparian and Ben Shapiro, as long as it's not boring, but I don't think it will be. Anna Kasparian, longtime member and host of The Young Turks, leftist queen, I love her. We watched recently her debate, uh, Dennis Prager, and that was just horribly embarrassing for Dennis. And I think there's definitely some sort of media apparatus working with the right to prevent their embarrassing moments from being published widely. We didn't see the one with Dennis either. And there was another example that I was thinking of the other day. It's just another example of some right winger showing their ass publicly, very publicly, and no one ever hearing about it. And like, I think debates are lame, but we're gonna get some good clips of Ben saying stupid shit for sure. Just like we got ones of Dennis. It doesn't do well because it doesn't say and destroys Ben Shapiro with facts. Well, it did fine. It got like 470,000 views, but like, if this was called Ben Shapiro destroys TYT's Anna Kasparian with facts and logic, that would have like 6 million views on his fucking channel. All right, let's, let's fucking get into this. So we're gonna have a conversation for the next roughly hour and a half. Chamber staff just, just had a stroke, I know that, because they know that I will do that. Uh, we're gonna go for about 55 minutes-ish, always add ish, because it's kind of a little bit of a, we're gonna hit there, but we're gonna have a great conversation tonight with Ben and Anna, I'm looking forward to it. I know all of you are too, because we've been talking to you. So, let's kind of start off. Let me ask each of you to introduce the other. Ben, would you like to introduce Anna? Sure, so, this is Anna Kasparian. She is, and first of all, a big round of applause for Anna because this is a Chamber of Commerce meeting. <laughs> it's so cringe. This sucks. She's the co-host of the immensely popular Young Turks, which is a show you can find on YouTube. It's also a podcast, and it's available pretty much everywhere. And uh, she is also the producer of that show, executive producer of that show. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Anna, your turn. Don't do it, Anna. Don't be cordial. Rip his heart out. <laughs> ben is the co-founder of uh, The Daily Wire, incredibly, incredibly well-known, uh, especially in the media space, the new media space specifically, but he's certainly made his rounds in traditional media as well. Um, and he has uh, really popularized a lot of conservative ideals, conservative beliefs that I think were getting a little played out by some of the uh, old guard of conservatism. Yeah, he made being conservative cool. Look how cool he is. All he did was like embolden a fucking generation of little like worthless nerds and giving them talking points while taking billionaire money. Like it sucks. Like if she were super mean right off the bat, then like it, she can't do that. Yeah, fucking soy face. Ben Shapiro, he's going to epically own Anna Kasparian. But here's the thing. I've already said it. Ben is not uploading clips from this debate. We have not seen any clips of this debate, and it's been a year. And TYT has, like, I don't get me wrong. I like TYT, but they don't know how to spread their shit. They, they don't operate in the same way that right-wing influencers do, and they don't get spread as wide and as far as they should. Hassan left TYT for a reason. They just try to pander to the right too often. I mean, yeah, like, in a lot of cases, they are too liberal and try to do, like, this unity message when I think leftism should be about mobilizing non-voters, not bridging the gap between leftists and fucking liberals or conservatives. But it's just they don't have... Like, I don't want to say media training. That's not the right word. But they don't have, like, a media... Like, you fucking turn... Like, look, dude. Like, they have 5 million subscribers. And, like... Every... What are these videos, dude? They upload, like, a fucking news station. Because, like, I get it. They want to be, like, normal news. But, like, it doesn't work the same as when Ben Shapiro does it. Like, they're not comparable. I wish it wasn't so, like, traditional news. And it was more, like modern i don't know because you can still have like the traditional show but you should have like a fucking just hire some fuckers from college humor and make some funny fucking shorts like make normal videos and normal content and like evolve with the times i don't know am i making any sense i'm high so for those of you who who looked at it you know our topic is leading political voices the next generation of leaders so your thought leaders within your individual um within your generation, a generation that's much younger than mine, um, w what would you like the people of your generation to know moving forward? Anna, let's start with you. Well, I think that my generation is certainly pretty passionate about changing things, certainly changing the way that they work and live. Uh, we're seeing that play out currently with the pandemic and the 
labor shortage that's taking place, and I'd like them to know that we don't really need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we've seen strategies and solutions that have worked in the past. Uh, this country has gone through many terrible things in its history, and it's very short history, you know, relative to other countries. And uh, despite all of those awful things that have happened, things like the Great Depression, for instance, uh, the country was still able to pull through. And I, I would suggest looking to history at the solutions that worked, um, specifically a strong labor movement, in order to you know, really rework the power dynamic that we're seeing right now in the workplace. I think a lot of the reasoning for not going back to the jobs that uh, workers were previously working in uh, prior to the pandemic has to do with the fact that, hey, you know, we've been staying home during the lockdown. Uh, now we realize that spending time with our family, having a little free time for ourselves, being able to go outdoors and do recreational things, that's important to us. So they're reimagining what their lives could be like if they take a little bit of power back uh, in the workplace. And I think that that's definitely possible. Um, they just got to fight for it. They got to organize. They got to work together and not get distracted by manufactured culture wars that we see play out in the media every day. I didn't want to cut her off because she made the perfect point. She talks too much. All right, brother. I'm going to be real. That's kind of misogynistic. Like, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to like point it out and be like, look at this misogynist. But like, you need to analyze why you think that. No, no, don't not kick them. Listen to me. <laughs> that is very normal, subconscious, underlying misogyny. This is debate. I thought it was a cut video. Okay, guys, listen, listen, listen. See what I mean? We have to be patient. They thought it was a cut video. This is a teachable moment for you guys to not jump down people's throats when you when you think they're saying something wrong. I want blood. No. <laughs> it's still kind of a weird comment just randomly. No. It's an extremely normal comment. It's a teachable moment in the sense where it's like, listen, you can address those things in a patient way and just point it out. And most normal people, when you say, hey, I think that might be like a misogynistic thing, most normal people are going to be like, oh, you know what? Maybe it is. Let me think about that. I'm very autistic and don't understand what Anna is saying. Don't worry. I'm going to dumb down what she said. Like the question isn't super clear, but she's basically addressing the whole of like the modern young generation. She's talking about Gen Z and she's saying we should look to the past like many young people are doing and look at the points where, you know, financial disparity and inflation are comparable to where they are today. And a lot of that is the early 1900s with the Great Depression and labor movements all throughout the 20th century. She's saying that whole period of time where there was so much economic disparity and working people came back and reclaimed the power that was being extracted from them without their consent and formed unions and, you know, built a strong middle class throughout, like, the 70s that Ronald Reagan dismantled in the, you know, it became dismantled as a result of Ronald Reagan's actions. Maybe we should try the Industrial Revolution again? Yeah. <laughs> Unions are super-based? Absolutely. Unions are, are a necessity. But she's saying that, that that is the direction that this young generation should be in, and many people are thinking that way. But it's like her assessment of like where we are and where we need to go. And she's 100 million percent correct. And now Ben Shapiro is going to say something infinitely less eloquent and infinitely less correct. <laughs> ben, how about folks on your side? So, I mean, I think that for folks on my side, I, I sort of have the same message for, for everybody on all sides, which is that uh, the world did not begin spinning when you were born. <laughs> Uh, and there's a great amount of wisdom, accumulated wisdom, that has built up over literally thousands of years, uh, in the United States over hundreds of years, uh, that is well worth going back to as a source of both inspiration and understanding of exactly why the system is supposed to weigh in, work in a, in a particular way. Translation from idiot language. History is good and all, but not unions. <laughs> and that requires a certain understanding of human nature, of human beings, as both capable of amazing things, but also as inherently flawed and ambitious, and why you need a governmental system that is capable of checking ambition with ambition, checks and balances, subsidiarity, the... This is literally all one sentence. If you would write it down, it would be all one sentence, because he never gets to the end. You expect him to say something about the thing that he was just describing, but he just keeps going, like, 
you're spiraling. It's it's insane. The belief in, in a federalist system that allows for experimentation on a local level without attempting to cram one size fits all solutions on everybody from the federal level. But that begins with reading history. It does begin with understanding some basic philosophies about how the United States works because you know those like grandpas that have ADHD very obviously, but like they grew up in the 50s and ADHD like back then just meant like, oh, hit him with a frying pan and a couple times, you know, <laughs> when he gets distracted and school so like they like hyper fixate on you and they just talk in this one long sentence that never ends and they're like oh and uh, you know my my sister sally had uh what was her cousin's name um oh yeah it was kangaroo she named her cousin kangaroo <laughs> like and, and you know i always thought that was a pretty funny name uh, last year, I actually found a dog named Kangaroo, and it's like, it just keeps going. That's how Ben makes arguments. If it feels like the country is coming apart, and it really does feel like that more and more every day. So if, okay, let's follow the sentence. So, if the world feels like it's falling apart, comma, then you make the next part of the sentence. If it feels like the country is coming apart, and it really does feel like that more and more. And it really does feel like that, which is just stalling time. Like he's just saying that so, cause he doesn't have, he started saying this sentence in his head. He said, if it feels like the country's coming apart right now, and then he didn't have the second half of the sentence yet. So he said, and it really, really does. That was just time for him to buy time so he could finish the sentence in his head. Uh, that is because uh, I think that there That's is a failure to agree on some of the central bases for the country. So we're either going to... That's because there is a failure to agree on the central bases, ba bases of the country. This is the sentence that he said. If, if the country feels like it's coming apart right now. That's because there's a failure to agree on the central bases of the country. What he could have said is, I think in America, we fail to agree on core principles that we should govern behind. I think that's costing this country. I am so high, I could still come up with that sentence. But he refuses to stop talking and he makes himself sound, he says really stupid things, but he says it so fast that you just assume he's saying smart things because you can't pay attention to the fucking stupid word choices he uses. So we're either going to have to clarify where the disagreements are or we're going to be in serious trouble as a country. And we need to clarify where the disagreements are. Yeah, where's the disagreement on abortion? Where is it? Where's the love? I love the answers because it leads directly into what I want to ask you about next. This is going to be the most obvious statement I'm going to make tonight. The last 18 months have seen significant turmoil, not only with COVID, but with our social, our cultural upheavals as we've seen uh, people, you know, protesting some just horrible, egregious acts. Uh, as you noted, the future of work, how we work, all those things are out there for discussion. Trust in institutions um, and, and, and trust or an understanding, as Ben said, of literally the basis of our society. These guys just like hearing themselves talk, really. Ask the question, you idiot. I saw a great quote from a noted political scientist who said, America is not a lie, but a disappointment, but a disappointment because it is a hope. Would you agree is that, that that's a good description? And would you also agree that the U.S. is an exceptional country? Ben, I'll start with you. What the fuck kind of question is that? Do you agree that the U.S. is the best country ever? I mean, I obviously believe that the United States is an exceptional country. I think that our history is filled with moments of glory. It's also filled with some terrible tragedy and some terrible evil. What is a moment of glory in America? Glory is a really strange word for him to choose. Glory has like a connotation of like combat. Conquering, which I would argue are the moments of tragedy. To suggest that America is a disappointment is to suggest that utopia is a real place. <laughs> Anna's face says it all. America's not a disappointment because it's the best country ever. <laughs> Whenever you say somebody's a disappointment, you have to say compared to what? And what, what exactly are you shooting for? Compared to the ideal? Of course, everybody's a disappointment. Saints are disappointments compared to the ideal. I love that. It's like positive nihilism. He's like, well, can't get better than it already is. It's bad, but... It'll never get better, it's impossible. 
But if what you're talking about is America as a whole is somehow disappointing compared to, for example, what other countries around the world stand for or what they have provided to their citizens or what they have provided to the globe, then by no means is America a disappointment. America. What has America provided to the globe that's been good? Oh my God. Like within its own borders, I guess you could make maybe some argument, but like to the world? America provided CO2 when they weren't bombing any part of the world they wanted. Yeah, you know, the invention of the nuclear bomb. That was a huge win <laughs> for the globe. Point in America is a tremendous success story. In fact, it's the greatest success story in world history. Oh my God. America is the best country in world history. Like you sound like a four year old. How do you clap for that? That's pathetic. So there are parts of that I agree with, uh, some parts that I disagree with. Uh, for the most part, I, I just want to note that the idea of America is an incredible uh, idea. Like, you have to say this shit in debates in America because Americans are so brain broken that, like, you have to have, like, insane nationalism. Like, you have to be crazy or I'm not going to take you seriously. Like, she has to say this shit because Ben already said it. And it's like, no, fuck this stupid fucking country, goddammit. I live here and I'm stuck here. I want to fix it. <laughs> so earlier this evening, we had, three of us had some interesting conversations about the way that our culture's broken, the way that civility has broken down. Let me give you a couple of numbers that are actually pretty scary. 15% of Americans have terminated a friendship over political differences. This is stupid culture bullshit. Guys, Republicans are losing friends. We have to do something about this. Uh, Kevin Drum, who I don't know, but is a liberal journalist with Mother Jones, said, quote, if you hate culture wars, blame liberals. He wrote that in Washington Monthly. Um, is it fair to blame more liberals for the culture divide, or is it one that both sides have to take blame for? I think that both sides certainly engage in manufactured culture wars, and it's frustrating to see it. Um, full disclosure, I myself uh, have engaged in it, and I think instead of being oblivious or delusional about it, um, it's important to acknowledge when you've made the mistakes, right? And so the demonizing doesn't help. Uh, at the end of the day, we have to realize that we're all Americans. We all want the same thing. Fundamentally, we are the same. We might have different solutions, different ideas. Demonizing the other side doesn't help uh, to accomplish any solutions. Like, this is like lib shit, right? It's like pretty surface level. But I think she's getting in an idea that is like a take very similar to my, my own. That like, I think leftists should engage with their friends and peers that are right wing there's obviously a limit to it but if you like have a friend that's like makes like an offhanded comment about like oh yeah like the homeless are really a problem you can like come to an understanding with them like you can radicalize your friends i don't have friends who are right wing yes you do <laughs> like maybe not fucking like trump supporters but like liberals even like you have a friend that has a bad take you have a friend that has some take that is like uninformed. I have takes like that, but like the average person is going to naturally have very liberal, if not right-wing takes on like a ton of issues. And I think we should be open-minded as leftists because worker solidarity is the first thing you should establish in someone you're trying to get to understand uh, leftist values. You should always start from a place that everyone understands. And the biggest, most easiest one is just like, demonstrate class solidarity and class consciousness and then work your way from there and a lot of normies and conservatives even understand class solidarity because they can see it it's like tangible you can have like a casual conversation with like some random fucking landscaper or some shit that's like kind of a, ch a chud but like your average joe is not like ben shapiro most of them aren't malicious when they advocate for things they just think it's good I mean, there are no incentives to engage in, you know, friendly conversation or friendly debate. I hate that my chair keeps, <laughs> you know, and I'm short, so I'm trying to Maybe figure out how to do this. Place. I don't know. I hate turning my back to people. Um, I oh, Ben's pretty short too. Don't worry about it. She's only five three, is she? That would mean Ben Shapiro is only like five five, and I kind of believe it. We don't see each other as fellow Americans. We don't see each other as even fellow colleagues or workers in the workplace. Everyone has a political identity and that's it. 
And that's not helpful. I think the division in the country is incredibly embarrassing, especially on a world stage. And we've got to be more cognizant of that as we engage in political discussions. So I certainly agree with an enormous amount of what, what Anna is saying about the, the nature of sort of the world that we live in, where people feel as though they are going to be ostracized socially. They feel that they might be fired, depending on their political point of view. No, people get fired for, like, being racist, not their political point of view. Chasing the truth. How tall is Ben Shapiro, really? Here he is with Dennis Prager, who's noted to be 6'4". I don't think he's 6'4". Yeah, the picture of him and Jordan. This one's fucking crazy, dude. He says this is photoshopped. I guess maybe, yeah, it is. It is. This is photoshopped. Fuck, I thought this was real. <laughs> this is the real one. But I don't think Jordan Peterson's that tall, is he? According to a Cato study, basically every political subgroup in the United States feels uncomfortable speaking openly about what they believe, except if you're on the far left, because then you get to find people's old tweets and, and do that sort of stuff. <laughs> that's such a stupid statistic. I don't think that's real for even one second. How many people are comfortable talking about their far left ideals We're in chat? You guys all love talking openly about it, right? You feel safe doing, doing that, talking about trans rights in public? And conservatives never want to talk about conservative stuff. They never do. It's crazy. They're always so, so quiet about it. I'm not going to pretend that I think that the culture wars are irrelevant. I, I don't. I think that, that many of the culture wars are, are highly relevant. I mean, that's his grift. He makes a living inventing the culture wars. And, and not just relevant, I think that they may be indicative of sort of where the country is going. Because the way that most people experience interactions with the government, uh, particularly the federal government or with politics generally, is not always based on tax rates or the very minute internecine debates that we have over $3.5 trillion bills that nobody knows what's in and then everybody just votes before they read the thing. Yeah, people aren't affected by economics. They're affected by cancel culture. I think that a lot of the ways that, that socially there, there's been a pretty strong push uh, from the left over the course of the last 10 years in particular, and it's driven a lot of reactionary resentment on the part of people who are on the right. And I would suggest that a lot of the, the support for President Trump, for example, was driven by precisely that. It wasn't just about his economic program, which differed from sort of the traditional laissez-faire Republican economic program. A lot of it was about the idea that he was a culture warrior who was going to punish enemies and, and, and all of this. He's right in that sense, right? In the sense where he's like, Donald Trump weaponized culture war issues to radicalize people into, into his base. But Ben thinks he did that because culture war issues are real. When he actually did that because they're not real and stupid. That there are things that he could provide fake solutions for because they're fake problems. I mean, one of the reasons that my family and I left California is not just because of the living standard, although Florida is way better. Uh, it is also because, you know, we, we left a place where we felt as though our children were going to be socially ostracized for a place where we feel our children are not going to be socially ostracized. And that's a big thing. He has this thing, and a lot of modern conservatives do. He's always got a simp for Florida. Like, any Republican state, Ben Shapiro was like, oh, it's, it's so much better. First, it was Tennessee. And then for some reason, Ben moved out of Nashville and moved to Florida for some reason. And now he just doesn't shut the fuck up every time Florida is mentioned. He's like, wow, what a better place to live. No, I mean, you actually brought up a, a few issues that I agree with. Um, number one issue is the constant policing of people's past, what they've said in the past. I think holding people to uh, the current standards based on the current culture um, you know, if, if you're looking at tweets, for instance, from 2009, and you're judging that tweet based on what the current culture or the current standards are, it's a little ridiculous, right? So going around demonizing people based on their past statements, um, it, it shuts down a conversation that could be had, right? A conversation about, oh, hey, look, society has actually progressed on this. This is a dumb thing to try to agree on. I only talk about these like more nuanced ideas of like the dynamics between different political groups to people I know who are already leftists. If I'm trying to actually like change someone's mind or persuade them in any way, I'm not going to try to meet them. That's like way up here. We need to start like down here and then work our way to those kinds of ideas over a long period of time. And, you know, look at what was OK. I mean, you, you have late night hosts who were in blackface not too long ago. Right. But the 
culture has changed. I think that you know society as a whole, not everyone, but society as a whole has realized, oh, well, blackface has a pretty terrible history, and maybe it's not a good idea to dress like that as like a cute little Halloween uh, costume. Ben Shapiro was like, well, the first amendment actually guarantees uh, freedom of expression. I don't think that the culture wars are, are fake. I think the culture wars are taking place. The point that I'm trying to make is that oftentimes, Whatever the culture war is of that moment, it is manufactured as a distraction. A perfect example will be, you know, critical race theory, which is not taught in elementary schools. Critical race theory is a graduate level uh, curriculum. And the fact that it's turned into some weird, like, oh, we need to ban critical race theory in elementary schools, it's ridiculous and a massive distraction that I think is intentionally meant to be a distraction from what people are really feeling frustrated about. The precariousness of their lives, of their work lives, uh, the fact that people feel overworked, that they have no control over the work that they're doing, that they feel alienated over the work that they're doing. Yes, alienated from their labor, lacking control of the means of production, tying it back perfectly to worker rights and worker power that she started with. That's how you make an argument. And then Ben's just gonna respond with gibberish. These are very real issues and I think that, you know, the fact that it's really largely been ignored by both the press and the very political leaders who were elected to represent them in the first place has led to the anger that we're seeing bubbling up both on the left and the right. Ben, I think you wanted to make a couple comments. Yeah, I mean, this will be a very quick note. I mean, I obviously disagree with you about critical race theory. Yeah, I do think it is a problem. Third graders are being taught the 1619 Project. <laughs> I mean, the fact is that when you are having elementary school students who are having to check off boxes with regard to their race and then explain to each other whether they are historically privileged or not in fourth or fifth grade, that's, that's a very dumbed down version of critical race theory. Yes, kids are learning how to make a nuke because they learned atoms exist. Yeah, that's true. They learn about race, so that means they know everything about the history of racism and slavery in America. And that's bad that they know that. There's sort of a game that gets played with regard to legal theories that end up being boiled down. Intersectionality is another great example of this. Kimberly Crenshaw writes a very intelligent law review article about intersectionality and how you can be a member of more than one minority group and be discriminated against in a variety of ways. And then that is used as the basis for a much broader move in American political life. But is that just not true? Like, but it is true. You can't argue against that. It's just factual. When you have Terry McAuliffe, who's running for governor of Virginia, literally saying in open debate that it should not be parents who are making the educational decisions for their children. It should be the people in education. I mean, that... that yeah. The people that are, ed like, taught how to do it. What the fuck do you mean? Yeah, Ben says democratize the school system. Every parent should have a say in what their kids are being taught. And if it conflicts, I don't know, fight to the death and whoever wins gets custody of all the kids. I'm not really buying that they're learning about critical race theory or even a boil down. I'm, I'm sure, I'm positive that, you know, elementary schools are not learning about systemic racism. And even if they are, uh, even if it's a boil down version of that, Learning about systemic racism is important. I think that that's something that's an issue in this country that uh, gets ignored or completely denied. And I think that's wrong. I think that's what also leads to the division that we're experiencing. Well, that's, right that's going to be the major culture war issue, right? Because the fact is that I, as a parent, believe that if you're going to teach. You think there's no systemic racism? I believe that it depends on how you define systemic racism. Oh, okay. He was about to say no, but it just depends on how you define it. I don't know. I'm the one who brought it up, but I'm not going to tell you how to define it. So if you're talking okay. about legal regimens of racism, no. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about history has after effects, of course. It's both, you idiot. What is wrong with him? I think there's a real problem with semantic overload in a lot of our political conversations. And when people say systemic racism, sometimes what they mean by systemic racism is history has consequences. You can't have 150 years of, oh, well, 300 years of slavery followed by Jim Crow and, uh, and that not have after effects, which of course is true. And sometimes what they mean is that every inequality in American public life is due to some systemic inequity that is currently taking place in the United States, which I think is absolutely 100% false. I mean, we certainly see that playing out in our criminal justice system. Are, are you going to deny that or are you going to say that, let's say, African Americans or Latinos are just inherently more criminal or I'm not going to say either of those things. I'm going right. to say Oh, it's neither. It's a secret third so thing. It's a secret third thing. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs>
that so as why an are they overrepresented well, in our prisons? I mean, especially this may be, when you consider this may be beyond the scope of our conversation. But the right. answer is because not all groups commit crimes at the same level. That has nothing to do with genetics. That has right. everything to do so, with circumstances. You guys hold those false. Exactly. Circumstances as a result of capitalism and the material conditions it creates for black communities. What is wrong? Oh my God. He just said the answer, but he said it in a way that makes him sound stupid. Did you guys hold those thoughts on education? Because I do want to get back to some of that too. But sure. let me move on to something else we talked about. It's like, while you guys are, you're about to make Ben Shapiro look like an idiot, let's move on. We talked about the trust issue. And there's some yep. very interesting surveys out there on trust. Uh, Gallup did a survey. There's a drop across the board in trust in all institutions, except law enforcement, which is very interesting. Um, Congress, sorry for my friends there, is the lowest. Uh, media is down there almost as low as Congress. Those that rank the highest were small business and the military. So this low media rank, is that fair or is that being manufactured as part of a culture war? Uh well, the low media rank is because fucking like Tucker Carlson and shit. Like they have allegiance to the media, but when you just say the media to a lot of people in America, that means liberal media. I mean, it's entirely fair. I mean, it, it's, I think that one of the things that we've seen for both good and bad, the, the, the fragmentation of media is a result of systemic distrust in the media, and that's existed for a very long time. I mean, that's nothing new. Uh, and I think that it's completely fair for people to look at the media. I know there are people on the left who think that the media is too right-wing, right? Wing, right? Uh, obviously, we on the right think that, that the media is far too left-wing. Which is laughable. I really love how they went from, like, a conversation Ben literally could not answer, like, where do you think systemic racism comes from? And the mediator, like, right as he was about to show his ass, the mediator was like, Okay, well, let's talk about something that Ben Shapiro cares about and nobody else in the world, which is distrust in the media and if it's legitimate or not. Yeah, people who say the media is such a red flag and if Ben Shapiro actually had honest analysis, he would talk about how it reflects anti-Semitic attitudes and conservative ideology, but he can't say that because that's where his audience is and that's where his bag is and they would just call him like a triggered liberal. Like, he couldn't even call out Candace Owens properly without his audience backfiring. And Candace Owens is, like, encouraging fucking Kanye West. The systemic lack of trust in media has some bad downstream effects sometimes because when there are no gatekeepers, there are no gatekeepers. So I like the fact that there are no gatekeepers because I think the, the gatekeepers were very often biased, but without gatekeepers, sometimes bad stuff gets through. If this were me in this debate, I would straight up just be like, yeah, this is a stupid question. I think there's much more pressing issues than trust in the media. And I understand like there's a level of importance. Like the media is an institution that people should to some degree like trust obviously because there needs to be like fact checking. But like there's just more important shit to me. If you have preconceived notions and all of a sudden you're hearing or reading something that challenges those preconceived notions, you're gonna have a negative reaction to it. And you see that playing out across the board. I'll give you an example. I mean, I have family members who are constantly consuming news online. Um, my mom's a good example, right? She's, uh, you'd be surprised she's my mom because she's <laughs> on Facebook. She clicked on a link to, let's say the Daily Wire, perfect example. Well, Facebook is gonna be offering up more Daily Wire type content and then all of a sudden when she's watching the Young Turks she'll be like well you know I read on Facebook or I read on the Daily Wire whatever uh, that X Y and Z happened and you're wrong right um, that conversation doesn't actually happen that often but I'm giving you an example <laughs> yeah he thought that was funny dude I was hopeful example, there for a second right? and so, <laughs> Oh my god, the fucking moderator is laughing way too long at this. <laughs> Listen to how long he's laughing. Well, I was hopeful example. there for a second. Right? And so, <laughs> so, Shut up! <laughs> look, there are all sorts of issues with the media, right? I mean, the, the media for the longest time completely ignored the very real frustrations that workers have been feeling in this country. I mean, the Federal Reserve released data indicating that nearly half of Americans can't even afford a $400 emergency. And Ben Shapiro is like, and that's why we should lower taxes. And it's like, yeah, man, that'll really help. <laughs> that'll help people get more money every month or every two weeks or whenever they're paid. Like, that's insane. At the same time, you tune into CNN, CNBC, MSNBC. I mean, it doesn't matter across the board. And they're like, the economy is doing great. Uh, you know, we're seeing uh, record growth. And what they're specifically talking about is the stock market. But the stock market is disconnected from the reality that the majority of workers are experiencing. Like, it's a huge reason why I think these talks of, of recession, like you keep hearing the word recession over and over and over again. We And we do feel the impacts of inflation for sure. 
But a lot of the recession isn't happening to normal people because normal people never got the growth that the economy got as a result of COVID and as a result of, I mean, everything since the financial crisis. Every huge boost in the market was not followed by a boost in income or wages for anyone below like fucking half a million dollars a year. So that's why I think like a lot of the talks of recession aren't affecting working class people yet. It can get worse for sure, but that's why I think, th like, economically, that's just how it is. There was nothing for people to lose in a recession. We're already doing bad. One other thing that I'll note is that the incentives are always in the wrong place. The kind of stories that I want to talk about on The Young Turks and do talk about on The Young Turks get no attention. They don't do well in terms of the number of views. I want to talk about international news. I want to talk about what's happening in Brazil. I want to talk about what ha what's happening in Ecuador. It'll get like maybe 40,000 views at most. You know what gets a lot of views? I don't know. Anna Kasparian destroys this person. Or here, here's the latest cat fight. Like, I hate it. It's garbage. It's garbage. It's sensationalist media. I mean, that's all Ben Shapiro is, is basically a fucking tabloid. At the dinner table, we're having an interesting conversation. It's clearly a generational thing. My generation grew up watching Walter Cronkite and uh, Huntley and Brinkley and all, and all these folks. and. One of the things that I saw in your bio was that you got interested in this field because of Barbara Walters. So what happens now to the Barbara Walters? I mean, where does news reporting go? Are we gonna, will the nightly news be a thing of the past? And are we simply gonna continue to retreat to those mediums that, that demonstrate that we know everything already? Where's, where's this gonna go now? Well, let me just note, I, I loved Barbara Walters on ABC's 2020, <laughs> so. Like, this is the part of, like, the people who do contribute to the Young Turks and our hosts and stuff that I'm just like, they are definitely libbed up and they are definitely involved in, like, legacy media and have this, like, journalistic, like, professionalism integrity where they have to, like, deal with all these libs and conservatives that are in the media and it's like really fucking annoying. It is the advantage to like online shit where there's less of that culture. There's like, it's more of like treat people how you fucking want to. If Ben Shapiro were on the, and I were on this stage right now, I would want to call him a huge piece of shit. And you can do that on a Twitch stream. You can even do that on a discord debate, but it's like taboo to do it in person in like a debate format. It's like, you know, it's not dignified. You, you lose credibility that way when it's like, no, like I'm right though. So it is something that, that Anna Kasparian is really good at, and it's like why she works so well in that world. But it also like leads you being a little libbed up. You're both born and raised in California. You left, you stayed, but we had an interesting conversation at the dinner table that maybe your perspectives on California aren't all that different. Ben, I know you said you, you were afraid your kids weren't gonna be, were gonna have a difficult time because of their political views. So um, are you sad you, that you left California or tell no, I have not thought for one day about that decision. That was the, it, it, was, it was one of the best decisions that I have ever made for my family. Why? Because it's less safe from gun violence and there's no income tax? Like, that's all you mean, is that you get more of your money. Uh, we are overjoyed. Florida is a wonderful state. Uh, no, it's basically, not. I just, I love how abusive they are to trans people systemically. I think it's fantastic. That way, if my child is ever trans, they have the most uh, difficult life imaginable. Because of my Orthodox Jewish faith, that means that I had to move to a place that had some significant Jewish resources. Yeah. Uh, and so I was looking for a place that had those resources, uh, was in a red state, preferably with 0% state income tax. Uh, and that narrowed it down to basically <laughs> Dallas and Florida. Uh, and so we ended up in Florida. Uh, it's wonderful. But I mean, it wasn't just that. It was, the, it was really a lifestyle thing because my wife for years was saying, yeah, we're paying higher taxes, but you make a lot of money. So, you know, that's fine. But the problem is you don't get any of the public services back in California. So in our area, which is a fairly decent suburb, you had just an inundation of homelessness in the area. Like my kids could not walk around the neighborhood. We'd open up our front gate. There'd be a person shooting heroin in their foot literally in front of our house. I don't believe that for a second. Ben Shapiro lived in probably the middle of Beverly Hills. We had our business on Ventura Boulevard. We had to board up windows during the, during the George Floyd, you know, some protests, some riots. It doesn't matter. It, a riot doesn't make it bad, and I'm sick of that fucking distinction. Like, riots can be justified. Ben Shapiro is pro-death penalty. He thinks the execution of George Floyd was justified, but riots aren't. It's okay for cops to murder, but God forbid people get upset about it. Ironic, he's talking about Orthodox Jew Judaism while the Torah has multiple genders listed. I, dude, in the same way that, like, Marjorie Taylor Greene isn't, like, a fucking Christian in the traditional sense, like, 
Ben Shapiro doesn't follow like like his own faith. It's crazy. He talks about how he's Jewish all the time, but like the Torah can debunk him. For example, he uses his fucking Judaism as an excuse for his homophobia. He's like, well, in the Torah, it says it's bad. And it's like, fuck you. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, he just made up his own faith, his own branch of Judaism. I always forget he's Jewish. That's probably why he wears the yarmulke, because nothing out of his mouth leads you to that conclusion. If you just heard him talk, you'd be like, man, this guy sounds anti-Semitic. And he actually is. He's a huge fan of Bibi Netanyahu, a Holocaust revisionist. When we left and we moved our main business to Nashville, and then my family uh, and a small core of the business moved to Florida, when we left, uh, we thought that we were going to lose probably half the people working for us. Instead, I think over 90% of the people were like, you're going, get us out of here. Everybody wanted out. There's a reason people are leaving California. Fucking no, poor people are leaving California. Like if you look at the actual demographics of who's leaving California, it's poor people because they can't afford the standard of living. It's too high. California is poorly governed right now. Um, you know, I was pretty blunt and uh, transparent about the fact that I signed the petition to recall Gavin Newsom. I, f I forgot she did say that. And I think it's like a symbolic thing, right? Because like, I think it's a stupid political decision, but like, I agree with the, the reasoning behind it. Now, unfortunately, the individuals running against him were worse than he was <laughs> or is. <laughs> and so unfortunately, when uh, the ballot showed up to my uh, in my mailbox, I ended up voting against the recall. Uh, but I was hoping that there would be a better candidate uh, to challenge him. Uh, I didn't like any of the candidates. Now, the reason why I've decided to stay in California is because I love the state. I know what the state is capable of, and I, I would much rather stay and fight to make the state better in any capacity that I have. Yeah, like that's also also something that is like really funny is that like if Ben had a fraction of the patriotism he demands of people like Colin Kaepernick, he would stay exactly where he is and say, hey, I am going to try to advocate to make this place better. But Ben never did any actual political donations apart from fucking Donald Trump. He doesn't do any on the ground organizing. And I mean, it's good that he doesn't. Don't get me wrong. But like he doesn't actually care about real tangible change on a local or even state level. He just wants his guy to be the president so taxes can be lowered for his corporation and his fucking corporate backers. Because that's what they pay him to think. Anna and TYT actually do get involved in local LA politics. Ben doesn't do shit like that. Because he doesn't actually care. You know, you have this effort to build public housing to alleviate some of the homelessness. But at the same time, you know, you have the uh, lawmakers in the state having like the, giving these sweetheart deals to developers who are very clearly inflating their prices and taking forever to build said public housing. So there's all sorts of mismanagement. I disagree with the way that they're handling the homelessness issue as well, although I think my solutions might be a little different. Yeah. Ben doesn't have solutions. He just wants to kill them, but won't say it. I think that this idea of, um, you know, being incredibly laxed with camping um, has been pretty disastrous uh, and has attracted, um, it, look, homelessness isn't just a California issue. It's, a, it's an issue throughout the country. Yeah, Florida has homelessness. I don't know what the fuck Ben's talking about. The rich area he lives in doesn't. But when other states are pretty strict against uh, encampments, and California is very lax, what do you think that's gonna do? It's gonna attract homelessness. We're not even lax on fucking camping. Cops constantly do sweeps of tents all the time where they just fucking break everything. Let's move on to another pu public policy issue, one that's uh, being debated in Washington right now. Uh, tax the rich is a very popular sentiment. It's also now a fashion statement, I guess, which we've, which we've all seen. Um, so when President Biden looks into the microphone and says, pay your fair share, what does that mean? It means that if you're one of the 55 corporations that literally paid absolutely nothing in federal income taxes uh, in 2020, uh, and in fact received $3.5 billion in tax refunds or rebates, um, or tax refunds, I should say, uh, maybe you should uh, pay your fair share. But here's the thing, if the tax code is written in a way where corporations can legally take advantage of loopholes and incredibly low effective corporate tax rates, they're gonna do it, right? So it's one thing to say pay your fair share, it's another thing to actually write 
uh, a tax code that is uh, a little more equitable and ensures that everyone is in fact paying their fair share. She came with receipts. No, it's just like part of being a leftist is knowing all this fucking goddamn information about the world because Republicans will constantly be like, well, it doesn't feel like that. Therefore, it's not true. It's, it's the same argument they've had against climate change. They just do it for everything. It feels like black people commit more crime, and so it's true. When it's like, no, it's over-policing. It's poorly funded schools. It's like a fucking intersection of issues. Ben, what's pay your fair share mean? I mean, the, the obvious answer would be a flat tax, but the, the, the longer answer is that the United States has one of the most progressive income tax systems on planet Earth. Uh, most of the systems in, for example, Northern Europe are far less progressive. The, the top tax rate kicks in a lot lower on the income scale. Because yeah, because there's less money there. The people who are at the top of the income bracket in the United States, the top quintile essentially pays all net taxes in the United States. Well, that ignores the fucking 50 corporations that paid zero. So let's talk about that. That's what we're talking about, Ben. And even still, if it, they pay all net taxes, that's clearly not enough. We either need to demand more from them, and I don't even necessarily think we need to tax the rich more yet. I think we tax the rich an adequate amount for now if we could just take 90% of the military budget and give it to things that actually need it. And then you raise taxes on the rich. There's like so much money stuffed away because we have too much and we have to fund weapons because it's the only thing America makes anymore. When we talk about you know, higher taxes on corporations, we do not have one of the world's lowest corporate tax rates. We are somewhere in the middle and look at the OECD countries. We are, we are certainly not the lowest on the totem pole in terms of our corporate tax rate. In fact, you know, right-wing sources like the Heritage Foundation will say that it is much friendlier to do business in places like Denmark or Sweden in many cases than it is to do business in the United States. Tax rate's pretty high in Denmark and Sweden. <laughs> it is, the personal income tax rate is very high in Denmark and Sweden. The corporate tax rate is basically near or on par with that of the United States. If we were to raise our corporate tax rate the way that, that President Biden is talking about, we'd actually have a higher corporate tax rate than China currently does. Okay. China is irrelevant to this conversation. America had, in the aftermath of World War II, like a 90% corporate tax rate. That's how we built the fucking highways and went to the moon, Ben. Like, you fucking claim that America's the greatest country in the whole wide world. Well, guess what? We became that country by taxing corporations, you idiot asshole. The notion that corporations ought to be paying tax at all, in my view, is mistaken. Man, this guy is awesome. To argue that the uh, corporate tax rates in the United States are too high or that, you know, I mean, first off, let me just touch on the comparison you gave regarding uh, tax, progressive taxes uh, in European countries versus the United States. I mean, yes, the taxes might be higher in those European countries, but what do people living in those countries get in return? They get incredible childcare. Paid family leave, health care, public transportation, and yet they don't have giant fucking motherfucking militaries, do they? The average American family two-income household spends a whopping 22% of their household income on childcare alone, right? So when you're talking about European countries that offer quality childcare, that by the way, that opens up the opportunity for people to go to work, something that we should maybe think about as we're dealing with this labor shortage, 64,000 women left the job force in April alone. Not because they want to, but because they can't afford childcare. Labor shortage, in quotes? No, there's a labor shortage, for sure. A million people died because of COVID, and a lot of those people were working class. Like she said, 64,000 women left the workforce in April of 2021, and that was just in one month. And over the course of the entire two years, the pandemic has fucking ravaged the country. Who knows how many more women have left the workforce? And over 90%, I'm pretty sure, haven't come back. So yes, people might pay more in taxes, including those lower on the income scale, but what they get in return is far greater than what people in this country have been getting. The United States has spent, since the beginning of the war on poverty, some $22 trillion. Okay, how many for the Iraq war and the war in Afghanistan? How many for fucking Operation Desert Storm? How much money did we spend on weapons this year alone? on training, on managing the, you know, 200 military bases all over the world. How much foreign aid did we give to Israel? How much aid did we give to fucking brutal regimes suppressing leftists all around the globe? Like, more than 22 tr trillion, I can tell you that. 
We spend an awful lot on social services in this country on a per capita level. That's not even true. In fact, it is very much on par with what the European countries spend. It's just not spent particularly well. When yeah, because it's wasted on private companies when they need to be state. Uh, state managed. Uh, a very young Elizabeth Warren, before she became Senator Elizabeth Warren, specifically wrote about universal child care, and she said that it actually was contributing to what she called the two-income track in a, in a book that she wrote in the early 2000s. And what she talked about is the fact that there are a lot of women who, for example, may not want to work, and what you're actually doing is incentivizing people to have to go to work because you are now providing child care, as opposed to providing a competitive advantage to, for example, families where one parent is working. Yeah. Women don't want to work, and therefore... You're forcing them to work by providing child care for them to go to work. See, that's not the case at all, actually. The European countries, which obviously have been used as a model by, by a lot of folks on the left, between 1970 and 1993, they experienced exorbitantly low rates of growth. And the reason for that was because they radically overburdened their social safety net systems. Okay, but they're good now, aren't they? What America did from the 70s to the 90s with this was the beginning of the shrinking of the middle class. And the direction we went in is clearly the wrong one. You would admit that yourself. It created enormous social problems. It created enormous immigration problems. So they had to scale a lot of those back. And why, your, but why, why would it create immigration problems? It created immigration problems because a lot of people were coming specifically for the benefits. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes, that, that would be, that would be to yeah. my point, which is it creates more yeah. problems very often than it's... I okay. mean, but, I mean, it, sure, I guess that's a... Yes, if your, I put a free donut sign in my shop, people will come for the... No, but if you, have, if you have a robust... If you have a society that actually takes care of its workers, right? If you have a society that makes your life a lot easier, people are going to want to immigrate. It's part of the reason why... At, at, you know, people wanted to come here. Like, she's baffled at the fact that Ben Shapiro thinks immigration's a bad thing. Like, that's, how do you argue with that? It's demonstrably not. People are going to want to live in countries that have both economic opportunity, the, the vastest but immigration, also the, the vastest social immigration, safety net programs sorry. that, again, just make your, I mean, we talk about freedom. If you look at the World Freedom Index, okay, we like to think of the United States as the freest country. We're not the freest country. She's getting off topic. I wouldn't have done that. I think you gotta, you gotta really hammer home what he's talking about. The issue with the United States is there used to be a time when public universities were free, right? You didn't have to dig yourself into a massive hole to get an education. There was a time in this country where there was universal child care. That was cut down to the point where it's like no longer in existence unless you're desperate and have like no money and need to take advantage of some programs that are available in some states. And that's like the point that Donald Trump says, like, that's when America was great. The Make America Great Again refers to that period where the corporate tax rate was over 90%, where fucking we built the highways in the fucking Hoover Dam. Like America built itself on the backs of high corporate tax rates and social safety nets. And then Ronald Reagan was like, let me destroy everything. Well, Nixon did it first, and then Reagan went fucking ham and cut everything and made this country a worse place. And then Fox News took that and radicalized your grandparents into thinking he was right. But my point is, like, we have an issue here where on one hand, you know, we're experiencing a labor shortage. We want people to go back to work. On the other hand, people literally can't afford the child care necessary in order to put their kids in a daycare, put their kids in child care, and be able to go to work so the, the, without the, their entire paycheck. The, 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 Biden bill, the Biden bill removes many work requirements for many of the payments that are being made to people, and it's incentivizing people not to go to back to work. No, that's demonstrably not true. People want to work because it gives them a sense of purpose. Like, it's just the way it is. Which is why we have 10 million open That's jobs in the United States and people not coming back That's to work. Not That's not true. It's because people died. Because people left the workforce. It's because wages are too low and they've been stagnant for like 40 years. You're such an idiot. So to go back to your immigration point, you made a, a mention a moment ago of people immigrating to the country for the benefits. That's just right. abjectly untrue. The fact is that the United States' great immigration growth throughout the beginning of the Republic all the way up through about 1930 was entirely driven by people who were leaving places that in many cases had broader benefits, places like Germany. Why were people leaving Germany? in the early 1900s that's crazy maybe it was because of world war one maybe it's because europe was all of europe was destroyed and america made a lot of money off of it that drives immigration but also so does bombing countries and undermining their governments like we've done in fucking central south america the middle east fucking central asia the pacific islands of course there's more immigration. America is one of the few countries you can live in that doesn't get fucking bombed by America most of the time. Our organization is one that on a daily basis supports 
whatever you want to call it, the free market system, system of uh, economic choice. It was disturbing to me, and I think to our organization, when the National Education Association uh, looked at a resolution, I believe it passed one of their committees, that called the free market system one of oppression, but didn't call out other totali totalitarian regimes. So what does it say when our educators don't seem to believe in the free market system? Well, I mean, obviously, I love this question. So uh, I, I will say that the, the National Education Association is a very far left group. And so it's not a particular surprise that they're ca characterizing uh, freedom of the market in, in that particular way. It also goes back to the conversation we were having earlier about what sort of control parents should have over the education of their own children. There's a reason I send my kids to private school. Uh, the, the notion that the capitalism is a system of unfreedom, while government largesse is a system of freedom, ignores the fact that somebody actually has to pay the bills. It also ignores the fact that all growth, not some, all growth that has ever happened is a result of capitalism, meaning it is the result of free market transactions in which people consent to services and goods from other people, in which people innovate and make new products. Like, that's not true, dude. The free market did not build America. FDR built America with his own goddamn fucking bare hands. He saved it. Like, fucking FDR was president for, like, fucking 15 years. There's a reason he kept winning elections over and over. He won, like, four elections. Because he's fucking... He actually gave people what they needed and saved the country from literally the brink of destruction in the aftermath of the Great Depression. America was so fucking rural and undeveloped until he established large national programs. Those weren't fucking free market transactions. There's a reason that we're not still riding horses and buggies around, and that is because of innovation. No, we drive cars around, and that is because of capitalism, that we don't ride trains, which was the case before cars. It's because people get to keep the fruit of their own labor and then use those fruits of their own labor in order to invest in things. The fruit under capitalism is a third of the fruit that you're creating. If you're a tree and you're growing an apple for you to have as a tree, capitalism is the farmer that takes half of the apple, takes like a two thirds of it and gives you the fucking scraps. That's your boss. That's the CEO of the fucking Panera Bread taking your wages that you are earning, the money that you are earning for them. That's not the fruit of your own labor. The fruit of your own labor would be actually having a say in a democratized workplace. The, the true growth in the American economy was never just a question of dollars and cents. It was what you got for those dollars and cents. All of that is driven by entrepreneurs who are willing to take risk. And when you disincentivize risk, you end up disincentivizing people from taking those risks. Okay, so the government should just do it themselves. If nobody wants to build a fucking building where there needs to be a building, the government can come up with the money to do it themselves. It's really not that fucking hard. Freedom is an interesting way of framing it because the fact of the matter is if you are financially stable, if you are, you know, in the top 10% of this country, for instance, you probably feel incredibly free. Also, if your health care is dependent on the job that you work in, you're much, 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 much less likely to take the risk for asking for a, way, a raise. And that's important to keep in mind. That's not fucking freedom. You don't have the freedom to just leave your job. You don't have the freedom to ask for fucking more hours, more money. You don't have the freedom to try to fucking unionize. How free do you feel if you're on the precipice of financial ruin, if you can't afford uh, paying for a medical emergency that you're experiencing? What do you do when you don't have health insurance, which tens of millions of Americans right now don't have because of the exorbitant prices associated with it? How free do you feel if you're a wage worker who has not experienced your real wages increase in literally decades? Not so since the 70s. You think Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon have something to, to do about that? I'll just say, I think that there's a bit of a definitional game that, that, that's very often played with the, the word freedom. Freedom obviously has two separate meanings. Isaiah Berlin talked extensively about the difference between positive liberty and negative liberty. What you're talking about are things that people need and things that people want, and that is not the same thing as liberty. Yeah, health care. Things people want. I'm talking about I, uh, what people need. People need health care. I, I, I don't disagree that people need health care, but to characterize that as a freedom is a very different thing. But people need it, Ben. What if they don't have money and they need it? Too bad? If the, if the goal of the government is to provide you the opportunity to seek things, right, then, then that is not the same thing as the government providing those things to you directly. You don't have the opportunity to seek anything if you are dying of a treatable disease. Why not just make it government funded so they don't suffer? Well, what if suffering is ethical? 
That's basically what he's saying. What if they suffered and it was funny? And again, I'm happy to discuss whether or not we should change the programming here, but I think that the, the sleight of hand that's played by equating freedom of speech, for example, or freedom from being murdered on the street. Okay, what about being murdered on the street by a heart attack? What about being murdered on the street by cancer? Just because you don't have anyone to execute over it doesn't make it any less of a tragedy. To characterize that in the same language that we'd use to discuss why you need a house, uh, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's a difference in kind. It's apples and oranges. Well, yeah, how, let's talk about houses, too, because... People have a right to shelter because they also need that as well. So I think that should also be provided. You fucking moron. You know, when we talk about redistribution of wealth, I mean, look at the amount of money that gets invested by our federal government in the form of research and development, whether we're talking about pharmaceutical companies or even companies like Tesla. The seed money from Tesla did not come from private investors. In fact, the same year that Obama's administration invested in the failed Solyndra project, they also invested the same amount into Tesla. And guess what? Tesla ended up being a massive success. The only downside to it, though, is that now you have Elon Musk who's whining and crying about having to pay his fair share of taxes when, during the pandemic, he became, for a brief period of time, the richest man literally in the world, right? So we I agree offer... with you about subsidies, by the way. I agree with you about subsidies. No one should have any of them. Because that means taxes are higher. So you, Welcome you to libertarianism. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, yeah. No. They don't agree about subsidies because Anna thinks subsidies should go to healthcare. That's literally her point, but he's not listening, so it doesn't matter. Look, those investments need to be made. That research and development needs to take place because private investors are not willing to take the risks necessary. It's true. That, that is, that is mean, fundamentally untrue. The There's a reason that fucking Wendy's had the same fucking menu forever is because corporations hate taking risks. Who's investing in SpaceX, asshole? other than the government. The federal government's research and development is what led to the internet. I mean, it's a huge part of it. Yeah, like the moon landing, the internet, every technological advantage America has ever made has been the result of government subsidies. The, the fact Look, that the government is a grab bag of cash does mean that the government will eventually invest in some things that are worthwhile. It will also invest in an awful lot of enormous piles of crap, okay, right? Gonna... Enormous piles of crap the government would invest in. Okay. Then nationalize them. Nationalize railroads. Nationalize healthcare. Nationalize public transportation. The government does it. That's the answer. They don't have to invest in shit if they just do it themselves. They have enough money to take it from the military. We are an organization that firmly believes in education choice. And we've got a lot of kids in this state and others that are sentenced to underperforming schools solely by virtue of their zip code. Mm -hmm. uh, we tell families in this commonwealth, um, that's your school. We would never tell them that's your supermarket, that's your doctor, that's your dentist, you get to choose. Yeah, but that's different though. And it has to do with how taxes work for funding of schools. If you want to fund schools even more than you wouldn't, like school choice doesn't need to be the case. Also, education is standardized, so it really wouldn't matter. Like all public schools teach basically the same shit as a kid who bounced from school to school for every fucking grade of elementary school. Like they all teach the same shit more or less. But it's the property taxes of the houses in that district that pay for the schools in that district. So if you just got the school's income from a direct tax or a tax on the wealthy, then it wouldn't be an issue. Can we really get to, to educational choice? Because a lot of these p parents can't afford to send their kids somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Can we really get to that real education choice given the current state of collective bargaining in this commonwealth and yeah. in this country to a large degree? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to say something that's incredibly unpopular with this group, and that's totally fine. Uh, the best education in the world currently takes place in Finland. Uh, they have the top education model and uh, they have completely banned private education i would do the same okay so uh first of all finland is not the united states and <laughs> fuck dude thank god ben i was so worried for a second guys music alert noise news alert attention finland is not the united states correspondent ben shapiro has officially confirmed that Finland is not the United States. We are pleased to announce <laughs> to all who may have thought otherwise, Finland is not 
part of the United States, nor is it the United States. It, it does happen a lot where people will take something that has worked in Sweden or something that has worked in Norway or something that has worked in Finland. They'll say, what if we just take that, import it here, and it'll work exactly the same way. Fun fact, this is a white supremacist talking point. And it typically does not work. That's because nothing has been tried from actual Nordic economic policy. That's bullshit. At best, it's been watered down to Republican liking, which fundamentally changes it. This is a white supremacist talking point because it implies that what works in Finland and Norway only works because they're all white and they all get along. But it wouldn't work here because it's too diverse. We're a real melting pot. They all have a similar culture is what they say. That's like the origin of where that fucking talking point comes from. The fact is that, that Finnish Americans make more money in the United States than they do in Finland, for example. They have longer life expectancies in the United States than they do in Finland. It's true of Swedish Americans, it's true of Nordic Americans. Life expectancy in Finland is much higher than the United States. No, you're correct. Hold, hold on, hold on. It's only 78 years, no. which is, by the way, Anna, comparable Anna, to Cuba. Anna, 78 Anna, Anna, years. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. You're correct. The life expectancy in Finland is longer than the life expectancy in the United States. That's not what I said. I said the life expectancy for Finnish Americans is longer oh, in the it. United States. What the fuck are you saying? You're saying the life expectancy of Finnish Americans is higher in the United States than it is in Finland. But still, the, the life expectancy of Finnish people is still higher than Finnish Americans, regardless of where they are. That's such a dishonest statistic. Yeah, because the Finnish people have the life expectancy gene. So we have to compare Finnish Americans that live in America and Finnish Americans that live in Finland, of which I imagine there aren't any. There's like six. And they're from America, so they have fucking American eating habits and American diets, probably. And then they go to Finland. Versus... The people who come from Finland to America. Okay, the fact is that the United States has an incredibly diverse population, and that diverse population encompasses an enormous number of people who have very different beliefs about how education ought to be done. To suggest that any national standard of education is going to not only please all of those people, but prove to be successful in such a wide variety of circumstances for some 330 million people. I think every single person in America is in education. That's very silly. Also, he's just saying a national education system wouldn't work. That's just not true. It would... We've tried this with a gradual, not gradually, radically increasing federal education budget over the course of the last 30 years, and what we've got is failing public schools all over the United States, except in specific local areas where there have been attempts to take back control locally. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see more, local, uh, more localization, and frankly, I'm quite pleased that if COVID had one decent effect, it was more people taking their kids out of the public schools. That's obscene. That's so disgusting. Like, fucking schools are so underfunded. Teachers are so underpaid. We've had this discussion in this country and a member of Congress has called for, and, and many others have, universal basic income. Um, and her, her comment was, we should institute a basic universal income for those unwilling to work. Would that be supported in this country? Would that be supported? Yeah. Um, I think on a broad level, the answer is no. Although I think that as time goes on and people become more dependent on government, then the answer is probably getting closer to yes. Why is that a bad thing? They always act like it's a bad thing when it just like, they just say it with a scary tone, like it is a bad thing when it's not. Should it be supported in this country that people who are unwilling to work should be paid not to work? Absolutely not. I, I don't see why the government should be incentivizing people who don't want okay. to work and have no excuse not to work, not to work. Everyone should just have what they need provided to them. And to say otherwise is barbaric. That's savagery. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, for me, universal basic income is not the end-all be-all of dealing with the economic issues that people are having. Uh, I know that, that there's been a lot of focus on that uh, because of Andrew Yang and his presidential run and his you know, demand that people get at least $1,000 a month. I don't think that that's going to solve the issues. Like, I agree. Obviously, like, it sounds good on paper, but Andrew Yang's proposal for UBI was pretty fucking heinous. We do $1,000 a month instead of welfare and food stamps, which is ultimately less than what people should be getting anyway, and then what most people get on welfare, food stamps, and other aid. People need more money than that. $1,000 a month on top of everything else, while also increasing every other social safety net, is viable. But replacing it with that is obscene. We've talked a lot about where we're going and a lot of pessimism and a lot of concerns. What gives you hope right now? I hate that. I want to see Ben's answer, though. What gives me hope is the fact that because this is such a diverse country and because what we are actually watching in real time is, is one of the great sorting features that we've seen in American public life in quite a while, right? We're seeing people like me move to Florida. We're seeing people who are in blue states want to stay in blue states. The divide in our country is better, actually. It gives me hope. And what that's going to lead to is more diversity in terms of the the 
attempted policies. Yeah, all the people in Florida are now trapped and can't get abortions and can't get health care and can't get medicine. And <laughs> it's great. It's really good. <laughs> and that in turn, I would hope, would lead to a couple of things. One, better empirical evidence as to what works and what doesn't. And two, I would really hope that it would lead people to look at the federal government and say, this is just something that cannot control the entire country at once with one giant rubric of rules. No, it can't. It's really not that deep. It's not that complicated. Like, the law can be the same in one place and another. In a lot of cases, it, they, a lot of laws are the same in one place to another. So if they were the same all over, that would actually be better. We have to let California be California, and we have to let Texas be Texas, and we have to let Florida be Florida. But dude, these states are the... They're composed legally of the constituents and the voters. But Florida does voter suppression. And if we can't agree to do that, when we are going to be locked in a never-ending battle for supremacy, and things are going to get very, very, very ugly before this is over. Ben's literally just advocating for fucking full federalism. I'm really hoping uh, that, that some form of subsidiarity is going to return uh, and that there will be some governmental figures who are willing to sort of reestablish the checks and balances uh, and, and localism that were the hallmark of the republic at the beginning and should be the hallmark of it again. Yeah, you're so right, Ben. Everything should be the same as it was in 1776. Nothing should ever change. Women should have never been given the right to vote. <laughs>